It's an absolute pleasure to be joining you. I'm conscious of the fact that we are the last barrier between yourselves and lunch. I will be absolutely dead certain to finish at 12.30 on the dot so Damien can give his closing remarks. This session is about the future. All of the previous sessions have been looking at where we are now or where we should be, but now we're going to take our crystal balls out to consider what the next stage might look like. I'm Sally Jones. I'm the Head of Trade Strategy at Ernst & Young. I spend my entire life looking at government and regulators and saying, yes, but so what? Or talking to corporates and saying, you really do need to care about this stuff. And I'm hoping that today's panel will be interactive and will give us a chance to give some commercial thoughts on what the future should look like. I'm going to start, though, with a nod to Sam, partly because everybody else has and he will be upset with me if I don't, but also to respond to a challenge he gave to us at the top of the conference, which is what is digital trade? And I'd like to offer a perspective from corporates, the users, as to what digital trade might mean. I think it's three things, at least from a practical perspective. The first is an opportunity to do existing trade better. Now, this is not the same as digitalization, which is effectively taking paper documents and making them electronic. This is about using existing data that's gathered electronically to make trade more efficient, more accurate, more robust, less risky. It's to help identify those anomalous transactions which might indicate that something is going awry or that a mistake has been made. That's, that's the first part of trade from a corporate perspective. The second is then how trade should be regulated, how digital trade should be regulated. My clients fear more than anything else inadvertently making a mistake. And as the plethora of protectionist measures rises, it becomes more and more difficult for companies to get it right. I've heard it said on more than one occasion by more than one company that they believe it is no longer actually possible for them to be compliant with every regime in the world because they are mutually incompatible. And doing something about that is definitely one part of the future. But perhaps a third and most interesting part of digital trade is how digitalization and digital is transforming what it is that we do, what our clients do, the new products and services that are available that didn't previously exist. Taking an example from a very different world, the world of pharmaceuticals, one of my clients is pouring millions and millions of dollars into research into digital printing of pharmaceutical pills on the basis that if you can print each person's pill in his or her bedroom, you can both ensure supply because you don't have to worry about border barriers and you can tailor each individual pill to each individual person's specific physiology and make it much more effective. Now, that's the kind of thing that technology can do. Arguably, it's the kind of thing that technology should do. How it's going to be regulated going forward is a, a really interesting matter. Now, data inevitably underpins all of this, whether it's the private data about a patient or the data about transactions. And of course, our conversation here is going to be about financial and related professional services. But let's not forget that almost all sectors, if not actually all sectors, are facing exactly the same questions. And therefore, the answers that we come up with today and in the future must be relevant to all of those. So I'm now going to turn to my panel. I'm going to ask each of them in turn, starting with Martin on my left, to introduce themselves, mostly because I've got a complete mental block about how Sabine's surname is pronounced, and I don't want to embarrass her or me by getting it wrong. So Martin, over to you. Uh, I'm a partner in the antitrust competition and trade group at Freshfields and the lead of our trade practice. Hi, I'm Sabina Chofu. Uh, I'm Associate Director for International Policy and Trade at uh, Tech UK, which is the trade association for the tech sector. And I'm delighted to be here and delighted to have this conversation move away from the idea of the digital trade is about tech companies only. So fantastic opportunity to speak today. Thank you. I'm Graham Floater. I'm the Director for Services Investment and Digital Trade at the Department for International Trade. Uh, I'm also the UK's Chief Negotiator for Trade with the US. Uh, and before that, I was international director uh, and executive board member at DCMS. 
Hello, my name is Vivian Arts. I'm chair of the IRSG Data Committee. I'm also on the, on the UK Expert Council for International Transfers advising DCMS. I'm chair of the board of directors of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and I'm a non-executive director for GLIFE. So I think we can all agree, a very eminent panel. Um, I always find it helpful with these things to flag a little bit in advance what's coming so that you know what to, to listen out for. We're going to start by looking at data flows and, and data policy, looking at the domestic regime, and then we're going to lift the conversation up to the international before finishing with a, a brief debate about how governments and businesses can better interact. And so on that note, let's start with that data flow, data policy part. It would be wrong to turn to anyone other than Vivian at this point. What do we need to look at in the short and medium term to ensure adequate, efficient, effective transfer of data? And let, let's start with the UK's domestic data regime. What are, the, what are its most important features to kind of level set our conversation? Super, thank you. And I think it's a really good starting point, which is where are we now, which helps us to build on where we want to go. So what have we inherited and where do we sit at the moment? Well, we do know that we have the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill currently sitting with Parliament, and that is looking to amend the UK uh, data legislation. But if you'll allow me to be provocative, it is not particularly ambitious when it comes to international transfers. It deals with lots of other issues in terms of simplification, um, much more uh, accessibility of data for individuals, for government and for business. Um, but on the international transfers pace, it is a bit of an open page. And I think therein lies the opportunity. And that's part of why uh, the Expert Council on International Transfers is helping to advise DCMS on how to be more ambitious in that space and what bridges need to be built as opposed to walls constructed. So on the, on the UK side, um, as you know, having left um, the EU, we have maintained adequacy arrangements across the board, um, exactly the same adequacy arrangements as we had when we were within the EU. Um, but there's a couple of good shout outs uh, where we are making great progress, um, one of which is the establishment of the Data Regulators Cooperation Forum. So what's been really interesting is actually to see um, data acknowledged as a thread that brings a number of our regulators together, whether that's the FCA, the ICO, the CMA, and um who oh, can't remember the other one it's Ofcom? Ofcom. thank you um, brings the, the, those regulators together reg, uh, recognizing the importance of data um, across our difference what is often seen as a silo in terms of regulation but we've also inherited quite a few challenges around data transfer specifically seen through the lens of schrems 2 uh, which means that although we live in a digital economy data continues to flow what we are seeing is increased localization increased complexity an increasing number of rules around what we can't do with data how we can't share it what additional checks we need to do before or we can share that data. And that's putting the friction into the system and the glue into the wheels, which is inhibiting our ability to support the growth of the digital economy. But I would say that the digital economy is with us here, digitization is with us here, it is now, um, and the challenge we have is that we're seeing this increase in localization and restrictions, which is slowing down progress, but it isn't necessarily stopping the flows, which is creating the situation which you mentioned, Sally, which is tremendous challenges for businesses on how to comply. Now, I always worry when a lawyer has his head in his hands Not that happened. something bad is going to happen. Martin, do you want to come in on that? So. Let me give one note of caution, Sally. When I speak to clients, the values that they wish the policymakers to subscribe to are consistency and certainty. And that means that sometimes proceeding with a degree of caution, even when there are lots of incentives to implement lots of measures. Now, Vivian's point about the UK data uh, reform uh, proposals is an excellent one. There's lots of good stuff that can be done there, but that has costs in terms of consistency, predictability, and in particular, if it were to do anything to threaten our adequacy vis-a-vis -vis the EU, I think that's the worst of all worlds in terms of uh, predictability and certainty. The other theme that I've really taken from this morning is the role of regulators, and whether that's through the Digital uh, Regulatory Cooperation Forum, 
bringing together the UK regulators uh, or the efforts to do that on a more international basis, I think that is something that we can start nationally and then that moves us into the international sphere. The ability of regulators to take quite granular concepts, build consensus around them, for example, building consensus around the appropriate dimensions of exceptions to the rule that we should permit free data flows across borders, I think is a hugely valuable role that regulators can play. We have to recognise that the policy goals that are pursued through some of these exceptions that Richard talked about, prudential uh, interest, national security interest, are legitimate. And those of us who are in favour of free flows of trade perhaps don't do ourselves a favour by being too dogmatic about it. So giving the regulators the space to develop that consensus in a smart way, I think would be very much in our favour to build consensus and allow us to do that then on the international level. I'm, I'm actually going to use Chair's privilege here to go off on a rant for just one minute, which is for all of the government and regulatory colleagues that are in the room, please give, government, give corporates a bit of certainty and notice. We can cope with anything literally anything if you give us a run up at it it's it's really really critical i remember um i uh, one of uh, a colleague from government joined the private sector and uh, after he'd been with my team for a handful of weeks i asked him what was the biggest shock to him about moving from the public to the private sector uh, and he said there were two things that really surprised him the first was that we really took audit independence seriously it's like, yeah, of course we do. Um, but the second thing was that when corporates say we need three years notice, it's because they need three years, three years notice. It's not that we can really do it in three months, but a bit longer would be nice. It's that we really do need three months notice. So rant over, but if government colleagues take one thing away, it, it would be that. Sorry, Martin, that was that point around international cooperation, about regulatory cooperation, about notice really as you can tell chimed with me i mean sabine graham does that resonate with you equally sabine let's start with you sabina oh um absolutely and i think you know there are multiple points you can make about you know international regulatory cooperation but it's probably the main is that certainly the main thing we are focusing on as a, as a tech sector now when we talk about digital trade um sure a lot of focus on data flows and we need to kind of sort that um international transfers regime and and ideally work with our partners on defining those globally but um there's so many more things and those are the barriers behind the border that kind of prevent companies from from actually um exporting and and accessing uh foreign markets so um you know uh, I'll let Graham talk about the successes of, of UK government policy. The FTAs, DAs are all fantastic instruments, but ultimately it depends on how we implement them and how many companies follow that journey and how we basically bring the business environment with us on, on that journey. Because, uh, you know, as policy professionals, we, we love good digital trade chapters, but ultimately uh, what will make a difference is how many of, you know, the companies we represent and we work with um, end up taking advantage of them. And that feels like a nice segue from the domestic to the to the international, Graham, over over to you. How how do you feel we should be using, let's start with bilaterals to to push the digital agenda? How well are we doing on that? What can we be doing better? Yeah, and, and first of all, I, I'd like to say uh, 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 that it's a very interesting report that Sam uh, and the team have put out uh, uh, very thought-provoking uh, and comes at a, at a very important time, I think, for digital trade. Um, uh, I think it's also worth reminding ourselves that uh, it's a pretty good environment out there compared to some. Uh, if you think that, and of course, it's always difficult to uh, put uh, estimates on this, but uh, some have estimated that uh, the digital economy is worth about 15% of global GDP or about uh, 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 11 trillion dollars uh, in in the money of a couple of years ago uh, and it's growing and that's probably uh, an underestimate for various reasons and um, so i think we should be very optimistic about it uh, as some uh, speakers have said already it's here uh, it's here to stay i think what we need to be wary of uh, is uh, 
uh, increased protectionism, and this comes through very strongly uh, in the report. Uh, and we know uh, that from the work of the OECD and others, uh, that this is something that is, uh, uh, that is increasing. And of course, it's not only a problem for digital trade, but it's also a problem uh, uh, more generally. Um, and we have an opportunity to lock in uh, the free flow of data uh, where it exists today uh, at a time uh, uh, when it is a relatively benign environment. And we can't just be complacent and think that that is always going to continue. Uh, particularly based on the actions of uh, some states uh, out there. Um, and so, first of all, with our bilateral uh, free trade agreements, uh, the most important priority for us is to lock in uh, that free flow of data. Once you've done that, you've covered about 90% of what you need to do in terms of uh, the framework in which you can operate. And then you can start to uh, determine how you can work uh, around the margins of that. Data adequacy is one uh, that can reduce friction even further. Uh, but if we don't have uh, a, a global regime uh, of the free flow of data, the modern economy will simply uh, cease to function. Uh, I mean, I don't need to tell this audience uh, that uh, over 90% of uh, the insurance industry is now digital. Uh, I think estimates are that 85% of uh, uh, financial services are digital. Uh, however you want to uh, uh, define it, uh, clearly, uh, you know, we are working in digital sectors and the UK is at the forefront of that. So what we've got to do is to ensure that that is not undermined, it's not eroded. Uh, and that's one of the first things that we can do with our uh, free trade agreements. That's what we did uh, when we first uh, started to look at how to use provisions effectively in the uh, UK Japan FTA uh, that uh, was the first one that uh, uh, my team negotiated. Uh, we went through uh, with Australia, with New Zealand, and of course, more recently, uh, negotiating the, uh, the Singapore Digital Economy Agreement, which goes even further. In all of these bilateral agreements, uh, we have provisions on the free flow of data and on data localization. Uh, and we can talk about the nuances around each of those, but uh, this is a really important first step. And just to finish uh, on this, Sally, I think there are two reasons why this is important. First of all, as somebody uh, uh, said earlier, the multilateral system moves slowly. We all want a multilateral solution you know, to provide certainty, consistency. Of course, that is what we're after for, uh, for business. Uh, and regulators internationally need to come together to be able to uh, achieve that. But we know it's going to take time. And so how do we achieve that over time? Well, one, we need to be uh, negotiating and they're at the negotiating table in the multilateral fora, particularly the WTA. We'll probably talk about all that later. Uh, uh, we, as the UK, brokered the first ever uh, 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 G7 digital trade principles last year, um, uh, which I think is a really important step forward in terms of uh, expanding the multilateral nature uh, of rules and principles. But ultimately, the fastest way you can get to global rules at the moment is to go bilaterally. And I know that sounds uh, counterintuitive, uh, but the more that uh, we have bilateral uh, deals uh, that have ambitious provisions that can support sectors like the UK financial services sector, uh, uh, as well as the wider economy, the more that they will become the norm of trade rules for others who are negotiating their own bilaterals. And it will also mean that in the multilateral negotiations, we've got something to talk about. Martin, you twitched. Did you want to come in on something? No, I was just, I was, I was agreeing. With agreeing that. profusely, excellent. Vivian, I'm conscious of the, the IRSG report on the future of international data transfers, which highlighted uh, measures that can be taken to better enable data transfer. I wanted if you wanted to come in on the the bilateral provisions as they relate to absolutely it's, it's been really lovely to, to hear from you um, in terms of the uh, two approaches adequacy which is one of the things that we supported in the international data transfers approach um, making adequacy assessments between two jurisdictions um, is indeed very productive but if there's one thing we know it's incredibly slow 
um, you, you know, it, it's taken the best part of 20 years to agree 13 of them. Um, and so it's an incredibly slow process. And I think the terminology we're also using around that adequacy doesn't necessarily resonate particularly well. Mutual recognition, something more constructive mm -hmm. would be helpful. So adequacy is certainly, or mutual recognition, um, is something that needs to be pursued. Um, I, one of the things we recommended as our ultimate goal would of course be a multilateral solution, but there is a middle step. And that middle step is, is around um, uh, certifications, standards, it's that interim piece where a business can actually perhaps take the initiative and help lead with solutions that are both technological as well as legal. I think one of the challenges we have in the data transfer space is that we're very much relying on legal solutions um, and an increased politicization of data, which is making agreements incredibly difficult to achieve. And there is a, a significant opportunity, whether it's the cross-border privacy rules, which um, although they have ambitions to be global, there's still a lot of work to be done there. But in coming up with technical and business standards um, that can facilitate uh, uh, the, the, the trust that needs to be, be developed to support the data flows going forward, and then they can feed into those multilateral solutions at the end of the day. So I think rather than waiting for things to happen, there is also a call to action for business to start in, in innovating in terms of what can those solutions potentially be, whether it's around cryptography, privacy enhancing technologies, um, and international standards um, that, that can be agreed upon to help facilitate and su support the flow of data in a trusted way. And I, I'm going again off piste, and Martin, I'm going to put you on notice that this, this is coming your, your direction. But I was particularly struck by your use of the phrase legal solutions, and presumably as a lawyer, a legal solution is music, music to your ears. How do you feel about that? So I, I, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but yes, I entirely agree with Vivian. And it's what I hear from my clients, that they want to be able to innovate. And the real danger actually is then the risk that policymakers try to put a legal structure all the way around that. Now that's understandable. We're in a world where money flows, uh, value is moving from the physical to the digital world. It becomes harder to regulate and it becomes harder to tax. And therefore the efforts to do that become more and more intense. And there's a real danger that that understandable wish to regulate and tax stymies what are often very creative solutions to come to good outcomes. So I'm uh, against legal solutions sometimes where actually we have got perfectly sensible commercial solutions that are well adapted to purpose and actually do provide certainty in a way that's achievable now without waiting 13 years for a data adequacy decision or even more for some sort of multilateral plurilateral solution. Very sensible. Yes, that's what lawyers do. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Graham, you, you very kindly stuck to the brief of my first question of, of bilateral free trade agreements. You mentioned in passing really the, the new generation of digital agreements. Do you see any tension between the broader free trade agreements with a digital chapter and something more specific to digital or do you, do you see them as effectively different sides of the same type of instrument? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I see them as uh, very closely uh, aligned uh, and that's certainly the, the approach that, that we take uh, when, uh, when my team are negotiating with them. Um, I mean, to put into context, uh, uh, most free trade agreements these days uh, have a digital chapter. Uh, and it's, uh, that's, that's uh, the legal uh, place for uh, the negotiation of the free flow data, but also uh, 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 trade facilitation in terms of uh, electronic documents, uh, in terms of uh, online consumer protections and, and all the rest of it that we have in our free trade agreements these days. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. If you look at most free trade agreements that were negotiated before uh, about, around about three or four years ago, uh, almost none had uh, anything on this. You, you have some provisions on e-commerce, but they're very light. Yeah? So we've come a long way from that perspective. Um, uh, and uh, what we've been trying to do in the UK uh, is to continue to build on 
the template that we have for ambitious provisions for digital trade in those digital chapters. And what we did with Singapore, and I have to say, you know, Singapore are, I think, along with the UK, uh, one of the one of the leaders in digital trade, uh, uh, just in terms of, of their innovative and pragmatic approach to, to this, which is why it was such a joy negotiating with them, I have to say. Um, uh, but what we did there was to uh, do two things. The first was to negotiate something that looks quite similar to, a, uh, to the digital chapter provisions in a, uh, in a free trade agreement, um, uh, but it, it, uh, it built on it in, in, uh, in two ways. One was uh, to go broader uh, and deeper with those provisions, and therefore, uh, if you look at the provisions in the Singapore DEA, uh, they, uh, we just have more binding provisions and they cover more, uh, more areas. Um, but the second uh, was that it came with a set of uh, memoranda of understanding uh, and also uh, other side agreements uh, that are intended to uh, promote the momentum behind regulatory cooperation uh, and behind cooperation between the two countries. And this is really important. Uh, because although we've always had cooperation uh, provisions in free trade agreements, uh, these go an awful lot further. They go into more detail and they provide um, a foundation for the governments and um, crucially the regulators of both countries to come together uh, and provi uh, pr it provides the momentum for that to happen. Um, and that is one of the uh, 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 benefits of, a, of, a, of an FTA, but also a digital economy agreement or a digital trade agreement uh, because it provides the political momentum behind things that could happen by themselves but don't um, and so i see the uh, the uk singapore dea uh, as a real uh, step change in the way that we uh, uh, look at not only the binding provisions that lock in uh, the the legal framework within which there's plenty of flexibility for business to innovate but it also provides that push for regulatory cooperation and that's the difference it builds on ftas uh, rather than being very different from them. and that that leads me neatly to um, sabina and the tech uk recent report on how to approach digital and technological issues uh, that go beyond just trade deals. So would you like to come in at this point and see if we can lift the conversation away from the bilateral and towards a broader? A I'll broader try, base? I'll try. But maybe I do start with um, an acknowledgement that, you know, the trade agreements that we have on the table are, are brilliant, like in terms of the digital trade chapters and the digital economy agreements. And I know there are other comings down the line. We've a we actually have like, you know, top high quality provisions in there that hopefully with um, the implementation phase and with our help and your help and everyone's help, um, we can actually um, get the industry to take advantage of them. Um, that said, um, sure, you know, we've got a WTO JSI negotiation going on in the background slowly, as you'd expect when you have 80 plus countries trying to agree on anything. Um, but that has the potential to, to hopefully kind of move the tide of protectionist um, measures uh, and, and hopefully set some standards for the digital economy. Obviously, it's not going to be as ambitious as what we have in digital economy agreements among like-minded countries, but we, we have an opportunity there um, to, to kind of set a bit of a global baseline for what digital trade should or um, shouldn't do. Uh, there's also obviously the moratorium uh, that, you know, was mentioned a couple of times already today. Um, I must say, I didn't expect that to actually survive the last ministerial conference. So uh, that, that was uh, news to me that it actually made it through. Um, so, um, you know, there is obviously, ideally, would like to have that permanent. Um, that will probably not happen uh, in, in the current climate. Uh, but as much as we can keep that theme on the table and probably one of the only major success stories of the WTO when it comes to digital trade, um, uh, the better. Um, Graham has mentioned the G7 digital trade principles. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's important to kind of maybe take a step back and think of, you know, what are we trying to achieve and where? Like, what's the best forum or what's the best organization? What's the best uh, agreement where, uh, where we can actually kind of move the dial forward on what issues? And, and I think definitely the G7 is probably uh, the, the best group where you, where you can achieve ambition 
where you can actually get um, people to, to, to work together, move the dial forward on, on digital trade. And, you know, hopefully the next presidencies will, will pick up that work and, and run with it. Um, then there's also the OECD, you know, that hasn't been mentioned, but there is important work they are done on AI principles. Um, again, potentially something that will set a slightly um, uh, wider standard for what, what, what the rules for AI should be. Um, and also partly OECD, and obviously that ended up being, um, being delivered by the G20, or partly delivered, we're still waiting, um, the digital tax deal, right? So there are, I think there are multiple forums where you can achieve multiple things. You just need to identify what those are and where, where to put the basically negotiating energy in. Um, and then I think for a, number of, um, for a number of countries on this planet, um, we are slightly entering into a, a post-FTA era. Um, you know, we are still negotiating FTAs and that's very good, um, but you know, we are seeing the US, it's moving away into this economic frameworks, whatever they are, um, uh, <laughs> discussion. Um, the EU, I mean, still kind of, you know, signing whatever is remaining to be signed. But, um, uh, but slowly we are kind of running out of partners to sign, to sign, to sign full FTAs with. And then what comes next? Um, and I think there is an interesting model that we currently have on the table um, between the EU and the US with the Tech and Trade Council. Still to be seen, what it actually delivers um, might have some news or might not have some news by December. And I think this is where we'll start to see whether there is still support for it. Um, if it moves too slowly and doesn't deliver, then interest will kind of drop. If it does start to you know, deliver, and I think we, we have seen some movement on export controls, we've seen some, some stuff on disinformation. I think there will be elements of it that will probably prove successful. And then, you know, is that a way to kind of talk about the complicated issues uh, outside of an FTA that may require, you know, two, um, uh, you know, too complicated a ratification process and so on. So I think, you know, there are multiple ways of trying to achieve digital trade ambitions that go beyond just FTA and digital economy agreements. And what kind of, if, if you are willing and you may not be, but what kind of time frame? would you put on those? Because you made a point a number of times, rightly, that oftentimes announcements are made, but the implementation takes far longer to follow through. Are we looking at a five-year time horizon, 10 years? Or? Oh, I mean, you know, I wish I had an answer to that, and then, uh, you know, could solve, could solve a lot of our problems if I knew when, when all of this will be agreed and signed, um, or what will come out of this. Um, but I think, you know, we have to expect things will get slower rather than quicker. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's fairly, I mean, not easy, but, you know, it's fairly easier to agree a trade agreement with New Zealand and Australia, you know, like-minded countries that we like and we have similar approaches to things than it is, for instance, with India. We'll see where that goes, right? But that, that is likely going to take longer. So a, a conversation between the EU and the US on tech and, and, technolo and on technology and trade that's likely going to take time and energy and a lot of people involved on both sides. It's hundreds of people involved in the, in the process. So I think WTO, probably the slowest of them all. Uh, <laughs> I think the more you move away from like two partners to 80 partners, the slower it gets. So don't hold our breaths probably is your not. message. Let's move on to one of the mechanisms that can create quicker momentum, which is policymakers and, and governments and businesses working more closely together. Um, Graham, in your experience, do you get effective communication between business and your department? Uh, and where does it work well? What can we do to get that communication working better? Just before I, I uh, come to that, I just wanted to uh, say something about um, the speed of, of these negotiations, uh, because uh, Sabina, as always, is uh, uh, very knowledgeable and, and understands the, the realities of negotiating these, these agreements. I'd be a little bit more optimistic, uh, just a little. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, first of all, uh, although it's rare to get breakthroughs in the WTO these days, you know, for some of us, we remember uh, the days uh, before the Doha round uh, to Uruguay and, uh, and Marrakesh and so on. 
uh, when it was extraordinary how much was achieved through the, through the WTO. And in some ways, it's been a victim of, of its own success. Um, uh, because what do you do? What do you do next? And it's it's clear that digital trade has really uh, overtaken the framework of the WTO as it was originally set out, and that's why the e-commerce negotiations are so so important. Um, but despite the fact that that breakthroughs are rare, we did see an agreement on domestic regulation services uh, recently at the WTO. That was a major step forward. A lot of people um, only a year previously were saying that that would never happen. Yeah, me for one. Uh, so, you know, um, the UK is there at the table. We are one of, uh, you know, very, very many other countries and uh, it, it's tough uh, to get consensus uh, uh, at that sort of level. But nevertheless, there are a lot of people who, uh, a lot of countries uh, who are like minded, who want to press forward. So, um, you know, let's see. And then in terms of, you know, the likes of the US and others, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've made some really good progress with the US on uh, discussions on digital trade, which we did in, uh, uh, in Aberdeen in, uh, in April this year, uh, announcing a, a roadmap to, to go forward on that. We'll have to see uh, the movement and the speed on it. But nevertheless, again, a year ago, people were saying we wouldn't even get there. So let's, uh, let's try to be optimistic. I think it's important that we are uh, because we owe it to uh, business and to uh, uh, to the sector. Uh, and on the business uh, question, yes, of course, communication between government and business uh, is critical. Uh, we take it very seriously indeed. We can't do our job. I can't do my job without understanding what business wants. We're not negotiating this for, for, for their you know, for deals for their own sake. We're, we're negotiating them for uh, greater market access, ultimately, uh, and better rules of the game and greater certainty. Um, so uh, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't listen very carefully to business. We have various vehicles for doing that. We have the TAGs, the trade advisory groups. Uh, we have one on uh, digital and telecoms. We have another one on financial services. We have one on professional business services uh, uh, and so on. Uh, those are really valuable for us. We have public consultations, an important part of uh, the negotiation process uh, before we even start negotiating to consult uh, on what stakeholders uh, uh, want to see from a negotiation. And of course, business play a very strong role in that. Um, but I think we need to do more. And I think you picked up this point, Sally, about implementation, uh, which is going to be critical. Uh, you know, we have had an unprecedented period of negotiating these modern digital uh, trade agreements over the last two years. Uh, uh, um, after a period of you know, many countries uh, spending over 15 years not being able to get very far, uh, it's going to get more difficult. It's going to get more challenging as we negotiate with countries, as Sabina said, uh, uh, who are perhaps not as like-minded. But it's it's worth uh, it's worth the prize. Um, but what we do need to do, as as well as bringing business in at, uh, before the negotiations and during the negotiations, is after the negotiation is completed, and that's you know, uh, it, it would be easy for me to say, well, my job's done, I'm the negotiator, I've got the deal, uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, what we have been doing is developing a, a much better uh, conduit through from the negotiations themselves uh, through to colleagues who are responsible for implementing them. Uh, and that can be done in a, in a variety of ways. For FTAs, we have uh, uh, various committees, digital trade would be uh, uh, part of a services committee. Uh, we have in Australia and, uh, and Japan, for instance, those FTAs, uh, uh, we have the financial services chapter, which uh, sets out consultations between uh, regulators uh, uh, with a uh, financial regulatory uh, forum. Uh, we have an MOU between the Treasury and, uh, uh, and uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, as well uh, on regulatory cooperation. And that I think is an important part of this as well, because if we're going to engage with uh, business and if business is going to have its voice heard, um, we need to have consultations not only between government and business, but also between the regulators and businesses, three ways. And if we can do that, not only domestically, but also within these fora with our bilateral partners, uh, uh, then I think uh, you know we we can we can uh, uh, we can go some way 
to furthering what I think we all want to see, which is greater regulatory cooperation and greater certainty. And that I think is the key. And the final thing I'll say on this is that it comes back to uh, the one of the main objectives of FTAs, which is not necessarily to only to bind in legal provisions uh, that uh, ensure that governments of the future here or uh, uh, our trading partners uh, don't unravel what is a, a really important component of the modern economy, data flows and digital trade, but also that momentum behind regulatory cooperation. And so what we've been doing is developing the digital trade network in Southeast Asia with colleagues out in Singapore uh, for businesses there to, to feed in uh, and, uh, and also thinking a lot more about how we can use our trade advisory groups on the back end of negotiations um, so that these are actually of practical use to people, to, to people and to businesses. I won't ask you now, but over lunch, I shall ask you to give yourself a mark out of 10 for your engagement with business. Uh, Vivian, same question to you. What's working? Where can improvements be made? Um, I think that the inclusion of data in FTAs and DEAs um, is incredibly helpful because, uh, to echo the point that's already been made, if you go back five years, it was practically non-existent. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, there was absolute um, resistance in that space. Um, so I think that the, the trajectory and certainly the clarity of UK government policy is incredibly helpful um, for businesses. I think what we could do with is um, clarity from regulators around understanding um, what we do with that delta between we have a, a policy approach, we have a framework in relation to DEAs and FTAs. Um, it will be a while before the detail is sorted out. Um, so what happens for businesses in the interim and for individuals and for society um, for the uh, certainty that is needed in order to continue to operate internationally um, and in a digital way. So I think we're making great progress, um, but I think that's also an opportunity to be much more creative. Um, and I would say that there's a certain level of urgency um, because we're not just talking about the digitized version of existing business. What we're actually talking about is new innovations. So if we're thinking about digital assets, the blockchain, metaverse, um, that is not waiting for an FTA. That is presenting us with challenges right here and now that will not suit many of the existing mechanisms by way of regulation and certainty. And so I think um, to echo the, the point that uh, Charlotte was making earlier, um, we need to be much more innovative in our approaches. Um, so the frameworks are great, the intention is super, um, but we actually also need some innovation and where the business is allowed to innovate um, of its own accord, but certainly with the support of regulators, that would be incredibly helpful. Martin, are your clients responding to these developments with innovation? Uh, yes, well, uh, can, can I start by saying a word about people who are not my clients? Yes. So who? It's, all, it, it's all very well. <laughs> Fresh Fields and HSBC and LSEG and MasterCard sitting here. We kind of get this stuff. And we've got enough people inside our buildings to deal with it. If you are an SME, that is quite a different situation. And I recognize that's not necessarily the group of people sitting in this room today. But for those of us who want to build a policy consensus around that, being supportive of a leveling up or a productivity agenda that explains the benefits of digital trade and realizes those benefits, makes it real for smaller businesses in the UK, is going to be really important to build that consensus. So I, I think it's just important for people who are not my clients as, as those who are. Uh, what do I hear from them? Uh, I guess most often when they come to, to, to you and me, they're saying, what, so, okay, so what does this mean in practice? So making it real often, I think, involves that dialogue with the regulator, the person that they know most. So the, uh, the dialogue between regulator and regulated business, regulator to regulator and regulator to government becomes critically important. One last point. There are other regulatory obstacles sitting alongside this, which I think are equally important when we're thinking about businesses like those in this room that want to grow their digital capabilities, their data capabilities, for example, M&A. And facilitating digital M&A is a critically important way to support the productivity agenda as well. Where 
businesses are building those skills and those data pools, we do see increased regulatory tension nowadays, whether that is through scepticism from a competition regulator about, well, does this data pool give you a, an unmatchable advantage? And we're not talking about Facebook here. We're not talking about uh, Microsoft. We're talking about people who are in uh, financial markets data. We're talking about insurers and reinsurers and brokers, people who are in this room. And understanding the benefits of that in a competitive market, I think is just as important as understanding the risks. Similarly with FDI, but that part of the transactional and the, the business uh, ecosystem is just as important as the detailed rules, I think, on transfer of data across borders. Sabina, one action, just one, that you could recommend to government to take, what would that be? Um, so on, on, on cooperation, I think, you know, it's, it's quite clear that both business can be both a kind of offer critical feedback, but also, um, uh, you know, be advocates in non-governmental forums so we can actually coordinate that kind of national message uh, in, in international fora, which, uh, which, you know, is particularly useful when you're operating in this particular world right now. And what I will also say, and I think it hasn't been raised, is that we need to involve civil society a lot more. Um, and I think it's particularly important around data flows. Um, we've seen a lot of misunderstandings coming out of, uh, especially of the early trade agreements of like, what does a trade agreement do and what it doesn't do? Um, you know, where is data protection actually regulated and how, you know, the whole, you know, digital trade agreements or trade agreements, adequacy, you know, data protection laws, how does that whole thing work? And I think, you know, if you're not kind of having that conversation kind of throughout and repeatedly, you kind of risk creating all this misunderstandings about, you know, all the ways in which kind of, you know, we are throwing away data protection standards for trade agreements. Um, so, so I think it's particularly important to kind of have that angle as well and make sure we actually speak to all stakeholders in society when we develop this. Good. Are there any questions from within the room? Yes, the lady over there, if you could wait for the mic so our online audience can hear us and give us your name and organisation, that'd be fantastic. Hi, thanks for that, guys. My name is Catherine. I actually work at Flint along with Sam. Uh, my question is for Graham. So there's been a bit of, you know, the paper recommends the use of data adequacy agreements sort of to progress tra digital trade. And I kind of wanted to know what government's view on this was in terms of like your digital trade policy, your trade negotiations, and how DIT and DCMS are sort of lined up on this and maybe looking to the future, what you're kind of thinking in this space, particularly if you think of like India. Not the easiest one to, to answer in a minute, <laughs> but if you can do 30 seconds or 60 seconds, that'd be fantastic. Uh, thanks for the question. Very good question. Uh, so I can genuinely say DIT and DCMS work extremely closely together. Uh, I have uh, DCMS colleagues in my negotiating team uh, when I'm negotiating uh, trade agreements. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, we consult on uh, one another uh, uh, on all things data flows. So uh, that's the first thing. We, we work as one, uh, as, as one uh, on that. We also work very closely with the Treasury, uh, who uh, clearly have an interest uh, uh, here, and other government departments as well. So that's the first thing, we work very closely. This is, I think the, coming back to your, uh, your first question, um, I see uh, free trade agreements and data adequacy going hand in hand. I mean, I was, I, I was at DCMS responsible for ensuring that the data flows kept, kept flowing with the EU. Uh, uh, and uh, for those of you who, uh, who can remember back, uh, back then, uh, uh, they were tricky times. Um, and we succeeded in that. Um, and we succeeded partly, I think, uh, because both, uh, both sides recognized its importance. Um, uh, at the same time, um, what we do need to do is think about if we have a framework set out by free trade agreements that allows for the lock-in of those free flows of data, what is then remaining in terms of the ability to uh, minimize the friction? And uh, data adequacy uh, decisions can do that 
uh, if it means that you can have a blanket decision for an entire country rather than a contract contract by contract uh, basis that uh, uh, that is an alternative so uh, i see them as completely compatible um, as long as the policies are thought through carefully uh, and uh, and together we've done that in the uk many other countries have very strange actually because we've had a, an online question um, and Damien, I know that you're looking to close the conference, but the, the, I think you've already actually answered the online question to a certain extent, which was around how you reconcile the need for clear, consistent regulation across jurisdictions with the need for flexibility and dynamism in a, a very fast moving environment. Just before, just before I hand over to Damien, Vivian, as our, as our regulatory expert, is there anything you want to talk, sort of say about that tension between certainty and, and dynamism? Um, I think it's a it's a tension that we will always be living with um, because our use of data continues to evolve, as does our technology. Um, but the real advantage, as um, has already been articulated around adequacy assessments, is that it does provide that blanket approach and level of certainty, which frankly is unachievable in any other mechanism out there at present. Um, whether it's contracts or standards or certifications, they tend to leave certain parties behind, uh, which is a bit challenging. But the difficulty, of course, with adequacy is that it is slow and it is bilateral. Uh, what we really want is multilateral adequacy, and that would be my wish. And that's a perfect note to end on. I'd like you to thank the panel for their expert views and hand over to Damien to close. So thank, thank you very much. A, a fantastic ending to what I think you all agree has been a really uh, brilliant morning. At the inception of, of this conference, we wanted to bring together um, leading thinkers to look at the key elements of digital trade, really to examine um, the challenges, the opportunities, and, and chart a way forward. So first, thanks to these and the fantastic speakers and panelists who've been stimulating passionate, occasionally a bit provocative as well. It's a very good thing. Um, there's been so much to engage with, and I'm really quite curious as to you know, what each of us is going to be taking away from this morning. I think the stakes are incredibly high. Finding innovative um, products, and if there's perhaps one word that came out of this panel, it was innovation, and that, that ability to innovate in terms of products and services, but to find the creative solutions that make that possible. So finding innovative products and services, creative solutions from, from government, from regulators, from businesses, and be that domestically, bilaterally, multilaterally, can unblock um, exciting ways forward that benefit consumers and businesses and strengthen not only the economy of, of the UK, but of all those countries that are prepared to drive forward the agenda. That's a great prize in very tough times and a really worthwhile ambition. So I'd like to say a, a final word of thanks to our, our partners who are uh, listed up there. Um, thanks to you for participating and for those online as well. Um, thanks to Duncan, um, Tareem and Pat, the team here, who've, uh, and Marcus, who've um, organized uh, this so effectively. Um, thanks to Flint for working with us on the report. And perhaps we can, in the traditional way, give a warm round of applause and thanks to not just this panel, but all of the panelists and speakers from this morning.